Greg Barnes is Julian Assange's legal advisor, a QC, an author, a political commentator and a former political candidate. He practices law in human rights and criminal defence and he's also got three books on Australian politics and he writes regularly for the Hobart Mercury. Now, Greg is a stout defender of human rights issues and there is no better person in Australia to discuss breaches of human rights and freedoms, especially with what's been happening during COVID. Good morning, Greg. Good morning. Now, you're a tireless defender of human rights. How do you think we're travelling here in Australia with what's going on? Well, I think, you know, COVID has thrown up a lot of challenges uh, for those who are practising in the area of human rights because you've got conflicting rights in a lot of cases. You've got the right of people to live uh, healthily and uh, for the community to be safe from the ravages of COVID. Uh, but alongside that, there's no doubt there are also rights of freedom of movement and freedom of speech and uh, a range of other rights that people have. Um, we, we've probably tipped the balance very much in favour of uh, the community good at the moment as opposed to individual rights. And again, that's been challenging, I think, for a lot of people. How do we rectify this thing, Greg? Well, I think the, the issue is uh, that there's no doubt that some of the uh, restrictions on freedoms uh, are required in order to uh, deal with a pandemic. I think the real issue is as we come out of it, making sure that those laws don't stay on the statute books. We have a, a habit in Australia, and we saw it with anti-terror laws after 9-11, that uh, a lot of those laws, uh, which are pretty draconian, st have stayed on our statute books and now being used in other contexts. So we've got to be very careful here that the way in which COVID has been dealt with, which really is not traditional legislation, it's more the Director of Public Health and Ministers and Premiers issuing directives, um, we've got to make sure that that doesn't become the norm, that we go back to proper scrutiny of legislation and that we don't leave uh, these very... Um, uh, these increased powers, particularly that police have, on the statute books. With the federalism that we have in our state's rights, with the patchwork of approaches and controls that we have, how do we get past that? Well, I think what this is showing are the limits of, of federalism, and, and that's why, you know, in so many areas we've tried to get a national approach. Um, it's really difficult for people. I was just talking to a couple of people in Tasmania the other day who wanted some advice. They'd been in Queensland... Uh, then had to drive through New South Wales with their camper van to get back to Tasmania and now find themselves on the end of a, a fine uh, in Tasmania because they've said that they didn't comply with COVID regulations. When they went to look at the regulations, they were just impossible to understand. And of course, they've got to deal with Queensland regulations, New South Wales and then Tasmania. So th that's been one of the major issues. You know, the premiers have used COVID to effectively play politics uh, particularly Western Australia, Tasmania, states like that, the smaller states. And uh, it, it has shown that um, when federalism is given its full head, it's not a good idea because you do get these... It's very difficult for people to understand and follow the law. Can they be fined in both jurisdictions of federal and the state? Well, I, I think the problem is that the federal government... Um, in so many of these areas could have sat down with the states and come to a sort of national consensus on laws, the way to harmonise laws, the way we do in a whole range of areas, and we have been doing now for 30 odd years. But unfortunately, I think what's happened here for a range of political reasons is the premiers have decided that they wanted to go it alone and they were going to get political capital out of dealing with their own jurisdictions. Uh, and it probably lack of leadership on the part of the federal government, although some limitations on powers to be able to do anything about it. And what about the closing of borders for Australians stuck overseas that are trying to get back? How does that sit with our uh, Charter of Human Rights? Well, I think it, what it shows is, you know, the lack of human rights protections in Australia. We don't have a Human Rights Act or Charter the way every other country that's comparable does. And so you've got limited rights. Uh, I think for Australians living overseas, that freedom of movement to be able to come back to the country of which you're a citizen is a fundamental right. And uh, I think the federal government has really failed to respect that right. And a lot of people are saying that, whether they're on the left or right of politics. And with your Julian Assange that you you advise, same same problem there? Well, I think the issue with Assange, and I'm, I, my role is advising the Australian campaign, and the issue there is that you know, you've got an Australian citizen who's facing an effective death penalty of 170 years 
for exposing the truth about the wars in uh, Afghanistan and, and Iraq, and particularly the war crimes committed by the Americans in Iraq, um, exercising that freedom of speech, uh, very important freedom, and you've got the Australian government sitting on its hands not protecting that citizen in circumstances where I think now every international human rights organisation such as Amnesty, et cetera, and all freedom of speech organisations are saying the prosecution needs to end. The, I remember the campaign to try and bring back the Bali Nine to serve their sentences in, in Australia had a fair, fair amount of support, yet we don't seem to have that for Julian Assange. Any idea why? I, I think, yeah, look, I think the issue with Assange is that uh, this case has gone on a long time, but certainly when you talk to people about it, when you engage them with the issue, uh, the vast majority of people just say, time's up, enough is enough. This case has gone on far too long. His health has deteriorated markedly. He's been held in Belmarsh Prison, which is a very oppressive environment. Um, and he's facing, as I say, uh, a, a life sentence and effective death penalty in the United States. Now, there have been, uh, the United States has said, oh, well, he can do his sentence in Australia. But um, the difficulty with that is that, of course, um, that would simply mean being transferred to an Australian prison to serve out uh, a very, very lengthy term. And the real issue in this case is whether or not a person should be on trial for exercising freedom of speech. Especially as a journalist, which is a protective uh, cover. Well, and that's why, that's, yeah, well, that's why in, in the United States, prosecutors have never gone after the New York Times, Washington Post and other publications, which also publish the Afghan and Iraq war logs because uh, they are journalists and have that protection. Assange is a journalist. I mean, he's a member of the MEAA. Um, his organisation was given a Walkley back, I think, in 2011. Uh, and the techniques that he used in this particular case are nothing particularly unusual. But, I, th you know, I think that the real issue for Australia is standing up for a citizen who's facing a very unfair justice process. We've seen government do it in the past and they should be doing it in this case. Any parallels with what we're seeing at the moment with council culture or opposing views being shouted down here with that freedom of speech that you so effectively advocate well, for? Well, you know, it, it's ironic, of course, that uh, the Trump administration, which complained about cancel culture, uh, were the ones who ramped up the case against uh, Julian Assange by charging him with the Espionage Act for the first time. And that has a real cancelling effect because if the Assange prosecution is successful, journalists like yourself and other journalists, um, even though you're not in the United States, uh, if you publish material which the United States finds embarrassing, it could seek to extradite you. And so that has a chilling effect on freedom of speech. Um, and as I say, it's ironic that it was the Trump administration that beefed up the indictment against Assange at the same time as complaining about lack of freedom of speech in the United States and cancel culture. It nearly seems a tit for tat between the conservative and liberal sides of any argument now that whereas the right was known for um, riding roughshod over other people, now it seems to be the left that have adopted their tactics. Well, I think on both sides, you know, you see you see that and you see hypocrisy on both sides uh, where people don't like particular views. I mean, I'll give you an example. Even this morning, Alan Tudge, the um, education minister, saying he thought it was outrageous that people would be teaching Anzac, uh, about Anzac Day and the Anzac tradition in a critical way. Uh, you know, it's sacred and it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be exposed like that. So, you know, on the one hand, you've got Tudge essentially trying to close down a debate, uh, which is a legitimate debate. But on the other hand, as you rightly say, you've got um, certainly some elements of the left which have indulged in cancel culture and, and very dangerously so. Yeah, it really seems like the values have become transactional. I'll, I'll give you your right to speak only if I have the right to speak. How do we get past yeah. this? Yeah, I mean, it's a good way to put it. It has become transactional in a way and, and, and tit for tat. Uh, and, and that sort of environment that we used to enjoy where people could say things uh, and, and had the right to say things, we're now becoming much more cautious in the way in which we speak. Look, I, I mean, that's not a, you know, some people, uh, of course, uh, uh, use this as a bit of a red flag for uh, essentially wanting to make racist remarks or, you know, but we're not talking about that here. What we're talking about is legitimate debates about issues um, where you should be able to uh, take uh, an opposing view um, and have that discussion broadly with people without being offensive. Yeah, it's, it's the, 
the straw man argument of hate speech becoming acceptable through accepting other points is just a, a far reach to me. But when we see yeah. universities yeah. cancelling people who have a different yeah. point of view, that's where the debates and is meant to happen. Yeah, no, look, that's exactly right. I mean, look, there is, there is, and rightly so, I'll say this as a lawyer, uh, you know, hate speech is, is, is dangerous when it is hate speech and we have laws and we've always had laws to protect against it and rightly we have laws to protect against it because it can be really, really destabilising for society and also hurt uh, those who are on the end of it. However, having said that, uh, that's, that's, hate speech is, is, is well-defined in the law what we're talking about here is something different. We're talking about the right to take a view, which is, for example, contrarian to the orthodoxy. So now when it comes to COVID, for example, uh, if people want to oppose uh, vaccination, if they want to oppose the science on COVID, uh, if they want to oppose the science on climate change, they ought to have that, that right. I, mean, I don't agree with it, but that's not the point. The point is they ought to have that right, and we shouldn't be shutting down debates uh, because we simply like a particular orthodoxy. And the debates are only a precursor to where the actual control happens, and that's with our democracy, where we vote for those that have the view that we want to see acted on. Isn't that the way yeah. we work? Well, I mean, I mean that's right. And, and, in, and in representative democracy, that's exactly the way it works. Um, I, I, think the, I think the issue in relation to freedom of speech uh, is that, and, and we said this, you, you rightly pointed to it uh, in a question previously, it, you know, it gets used as a way of shutting down um, or the limits on freedom of speech gets used as a way of shutting people down. I mean, there are limits to freedom of speech. That's, as I say, that's why we have hate speech laws, why we have uh, defamation laws, um, although defamation laws now in Australia have become more liberal since July 1st. Uh, but um, it, it's really important that we don't lose sight of that that fundamental value of liberal democracy, which is the exchange of views and the robust exchange of views. How do we separate the religious freedom bill that they're currently debating, where it seems to me as somebody who's not part of the religious right, that a lot of times religious freedom is only invoked to actually oppress or offend those who don't uh, hold it. Is it a freedom or is it something that's used as a bit of a stick? I think it's used as a stick, and, a, and I think uh, the government is using it as a, as a political wedge issue, as they've done with a lot of these so-called culture debate issues. I don't, I don't see any need for it. I mean, I think that's the point. Um, I don't, you know, there are many people who go to church. There are many people who believe in, uh, you know, believe in a higher being and uh, practice uh, their religion, whatever it may be. And uh, I don't think there's any threat to that in Australia. There's never been a threat. Um, this is, this is not a freedom bill. Uh, this is a bill which would privilege certain groups in the community uh, and for that reason should be opposed. I mean, the, the reality of Australia today is that it's essentially a secular society. If you look at all the data that comes out of any census in recent years, this is not a religious society. It's based on a set of values, some of which are, have religious connotations, others don't. Uh, they're just human values. Uh, and we've got to be very careful that we're not protecting uh, or privileging uh, people who have a religion over those who don't. Uh, Fiona Patton, I think, recently put a motion to remove the Lord's Prayer from Parliament, and that's been screamed down as a impingement on people's religious freedom. How does that sit within the human rights or the freedom of speech sphere? Well, I think a human rights argument would be to support Fiona. Um, that's because uh, a human rights argument would say that the Lord's Prayer it relates to a specific religion. One, that's Christianity, ignores other religions. Two, uh, that there are many, many people, probably the, the bulk of parliamentarians uh, who don't uh, uh, practice religion. And three, which I think is really important, is I don't know any other workplaces, unless it's consensual, in other words, unless the people come together, uh, where uh, you're forced to open your day with uh, a religious prayer. Um, and this is a workplace. It's a legislature, yes, but it's a workplace. And so uh, we, we don't do it in the courts. Uh, and I practice in the courts every day. Um, there's no logic in doing it in the parliament. How would the um, marriage equality plebiscite fit within the freedom of speech, go where people would 
advocate that I have my right to have the say on how you should live your life? Or is it a freedom as a nation to have some say in how we, how we regulate things? Well, you know, I, I mean, that's a, a bigger issue about the role of government. And I think there's, you know, certainly my view, and I, I would see myself as a genuine liberal as opposed to a member of a political party that calls itself that. Uh, you know, I, I think we try and regulate far too much of social life. Um, and, and the same-sex marriage debate was a good example of that. Those who opposed it uh, didn't have a leg to stand on because at the end of the day, what, what's the state's role in telling consensual adults mm -hmm. that they can or can't live in a particular way? Um, the state has, should have no role. Um, and we do live in a society where we've had um, an increasing amount of attempts to have the state tell us how we can and can't live, um, some of which we've been talking about this morning. And that's just a good example of that. I mean, at the end of the day, uh, the state should have, I mean, it's arguable, the state should have no role in marriage other than, uh, or relationships, other than uh, for the purposes of ensuring that there's a legal framework if there's a separation and a breakdown and that property rights can be allocated, rights in relation to children. Uh, or alternatively, as a certificate, if it's required um, for a person uh, to to achieve some end. Great. And just to close with, Greg, how is uh, Julian travelling? What what's the next point there? Where where will we see some yeah. movement? Uh, so there's been uh, there's an appeal now. I think two days in October. Uh, I mean, my reading last week there was an appeal uh, court which had a preliminary look at the appeal grounds. Uh, my own view of the case is that I, I think he's, you know, I think he's going to hold his ground. In other words, the uh, decision, original decision, will hold, and that is that uh, there uh, should not be an extradition. Um, the question is whether the Biden administration will continue to pursue it uh, if it loses again in the appeal court. Uh, Julian's own health has deteriorated. His partner Stella Morris has been a very articulate advocate of the suffering that he's endured. I speak with his father, father regularly, and uh, he indicates the same. He's held in Belmarsh Prison, which is like essentially like holding someone in Goulburn Supermax or Barwon Prison in Victoria. Really stringent, tough, relentlessly tough conditions. And you know, this is a person who hasn't been convicted of a criminal offence other than a, a breach of bail for which he served his time. So. Uh, you know, for all those reasons, it's an unfair case. And for all those reasons, as I keep saying, this is why the Australian government should get involved. Greg Barnes, SC, thanks so much for your time and a fascinating discussion around human rights. Thank you.